way I read it is 100% of these FY24 performance rights will be best if St. Barbara absolute total shareholder return is greater than 20% cumulatively over the three years from 1st of July 2023 to 2026. Geez, we're going to go up 5% a year. It's 6.3%. 6. 6.3% 6, 6. per annum would result in 100% of the performance rights vesting. You guys mentioned MinRes bond the other day that they did. I was priced at 9.25% for a debt instrument. Yet the performance here for St. Barbara equity is 6.3%. So they could pretty much put their cash into a term deposit at the moment <laughs> and probably get that shareholder return. Let's, let's talk about one that is, you know, probably not the most undervalued lithium play out there, Wildcat. Wow, good, yeah. I like that, Wildcat. <laughs> right, g'day, money miners. Thursday, fuck, is it Thursday? Yeah, it is. Yeah, 12th. 12th of two. Minor news every day, you lose track. 12th of October. Boys, what have we got today? Line Town, bit of an update on the Albemarle DD. That's uh, it, a bit on Delta. Mm, Delta lithium, but about gold. Mm-hmm. That's it, well, a bit of both. Trav, you've got uh, St. Barb's. Yeah, mate, I Some, can't dear, help myself. Dear to you, well, vested interest, Trav, that 500 bucks you yeah. put in, mate. It's not 500. Is yeah, it? I was going to say, she must have hired what, what is it now? Uh, it's a... A couple of Genesis shares and not much. <laughs> not if only, much if only yeah. they'd distribute some money to you. Anyway, yeah. uh, bit on AVZ, Whitehaven. No, and no, we'll save that for later. I'll save it. Right. Yeah. right. But, right. but I know you've got, you got Wildcat coming. Oh, and just a, bit a of, brief bit on Wildcat, but not too, yeah. not too much. Um, Beautiful. And BlackRock, eh? Yep. Beautiful. Boys, uh, sponsors today, JP Search Trav, we've been, I think, adequately flying the flag for him since you've been away. JD stepped in as the second wheel, mate. Yeah, yeah. What's the uh, tell for the – I'll just leave it to you because I know you haven't <laughs> had, had the pleasure of talking about him for a couple of weeks, mate. Dear to your heart, these boys, Michael and Zav. Mate, basically, if the podcast goes to shit and um, JD and I, and now you as well, I reckon, you could you could have a career change into finance. If the podcast goes to shit, if everything goes tits up, we're going to need a job in finance. And, you know, we're not head honchos yet. So we're, we're bloody, we'd be slotting in at an investment bank somewhere at an associate level or a family office. I wouldn't mind a family office, a bit of buy side, cruisy life. Mm. Um, I'd do that. And um, and Xavier and Michael are the people to bloody slot us in somewhere because they've got all the connections in that industry. And I, but I think me specifically, Trav, I don't think they'd get me a job because that would mean they get shit people a job in finance. Whereas <laughs> they they will sell, they will get you premium finance personnel. I might be like a little nipper or something, a graduate. <laughs> I wouldn't but, undersell yourself, Matty. It's, yeah, the, the, it's about the rate at which you hey, learn. You're, you're the connector. I'm the, I'm the <laughs> connector. <laughs> the <Yeah>. clipper. That's <laughs> it. Take a clipper. Give JP a search for all your uh, finance yep. recruitment needs. Especially and, if you've got any valuation experience at the big four, like leave that job and go work somewhere good. <laughs> That's pretty direct. <laughs> if you do want to do that, JP, and so corporates that want to, you know, have the job sort of done for them, you know, they yeah. go both ways. You know, both yeah. sides of the, the and, deal. And you, you, you'll be speaking to the owners, their GCs, and they'll give you a game of golf at Cotter's Low. So beauty, right, awesome. boys? Line Town DD is well. Is it over, or they're getting a, they're getting a week extension? So is it over? It's not yeah. over. I don't know who wrote that heading, but um, yeah, who did? It's it? been. Uh, well, it definitely wasn't me. <laughs> Because I don't write it. So, you know, we've been speaking about this one every other day from a few different angles, but essentially the update that's come out today, Maddie, is that the uh, the DD is not over. They are, they're close, you know, they're almost there, but they're not quite done. So Lion Town has given Albemarle another seven days to enable them to turn their uh, proposal into a binding proposal. So is, is any, do you think any element of Gina Reinhardt's Shareholding is a yeah. why this has been extended by a week. Totally, this is seven days to try figure and out what the fuck we're going to do with Gina. Try and <laughs> yeah, work out an outcome with Gina. If she, like it's doubt they'll be able to work out an outcome with Gina because she bought ninety nine percent. Not to probably not to just jack up the price and make a quick mm. buck. Um, but heck, that's what they're going to try use these seven <laughs> days for. I'd imagine is to try and wrap up a solution with Gina. Whatever that, whatever that may be. So. Yeah, no. We're, look, we've probably spitballed to the death on this, so we'll probably leave it till we've got a bit more, a bit yep. more info. We did, you. we did see an update from Hancock, though. Just a, a two-liner. They have reached their strategic stake objectives, and here was a line read pretty punchy to me, mate. Hancock now looks forward to a prominent influence on Lion Town's future. Keyword so, influence. Yeah, prominent. They are obviously the major shareholder now. So let's see how that one plays out. Yeah, and, and it's both Lion Town losing a bit of power and possibly 
Mr. Timothy Goyder now too because mm. uh, he's the, he's not the big swing and vote anymore. Well, I mean, he may not be the biggest individual shareholder, but he does have influence broader than just his shareholding as but well. Now, now there is one one holder that can influence that scheme of arrangement. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Mm. Let's get into uh, Delta Lithiums, and well, which was let's previously, uh, oh, shit, what was it called now? Red it metals. Was, red. Uh, yeah. Red dirt. Red dirt. Red dirt. It, so it was it, it red was, dirt, which was originally a gold exploration company. Yes, but it wasn't called Red Dirt when they bought this asset either. It was. Yeah, it was TNT. Oh, when they bought it and then became Red Dirt? Yeah. Ah. They were only Red Dirt for a, a, a brief, brief flickering moment. So when they bought it in late 21, they bought the Mount Ida Gold Project. And, you know, since then they've had a couple name changes. Gold was actually mined in this area back in the day. I think they picked it up for 11 million bucks. There's even an old shaft there from the gold mining days. But obviously lithium has been all the focus. But what they've come out with at Mount Ida's Gold Project is... 412,000 ounces at 4.1 grams. So not bad, pretty tidy. 50% of that is in the indicated category. It's pretty respectable, right? Yeah, I mean, mm. especially given where it sits. So it's, I mean, in on top of and adjacent to the lithium, they're not having to build a, a separate mine. So a bit under half is in the designated open pit and a bit over half in the underground. Like I said, 4.1 grams per tonne is... Not bad at all. It's all on granted mining leases. I think 85% of it from memory comes within the area that they were looking to, that they'd already put forward in the mining proposal that they're yet to receive um, government approval from. So it's all sort of go at the moment there. And I mean, the way the company looks at this is it's really an additional revenue stream. It's not going to stack up on its own, but you know, from the, the lithium products, obviously we've been speaking about a DSO, and then down the track of concentrate, this would be a sort of third revenue stream yeah. that they could potentially source. And the fact it's on top of the lithium, it kind of, yeah, you, you can think about your per share dilution is probably going to be lower because you can monetize cash flow, you know, for less upfront capex. Exactly. Gold, gold if, DSI. Yep. So, it, well, if <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, shallower, that shallower sort of stuff, you can sort of imagine getting in a, in a pre-strip, if the Met is amenable... Yeah. It means you can get a bit more cash in the door a bit sooner. So is that is that um so is this gold this gold depot is that going to be in and around so that you'll go underground and there'll be lithium ore body and a gold ore body? Uh, I'll flick up on the YouTube a, a good um, image that depicts it nicely. It sort of sits a bit shallower, and then you have like you would sort of say the lithium looks very amenable to underground mining. It sort of plunges a lot a lot deeper. So Met is a, a key sort of question. Um, with this one, we don't know if it's amenable to just a sort of simple, you know, CIL type process. Toll trading could be an option. There's, uh, there's two two mills really close. One is I think brand, three. brand spanking new one, privately owned by Oren Group. That was commissioned by GR Engineering in May this year. It looks schmick. One point five million ton per annum plants, literally five kilometers away. Yep. And then Orabanda is I think seventy odd yeah, kilometers away. The, the Bottle Creek one is yep. within ten kilometers. Yeah. Gualia is within a hundred kilometers. I think. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you're looking at, um, I'm top, sure any one of those mills would take high grade stuff to yeah, displace whatever. So I'm sure Orabanda is getting hit up by numerous parties for toll trading. Yeah. So toll trading is on the table. The, mm. the company mentioned that. In well, you, the you'd imagine if it's pretty shallow, you would you would assume oxide and free milling. Well, you, I like. You like I sort of said, a bit less than half is in that shallower portion, but you know that that would still equate to I think 170, 180,000 ounces. So yeah, not bad. Very good, mate. Uh, Trav, right, you've boy. done a bit of a dive on Saint Barb's, and obviously as we disclosed top of the show, ding, 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 ding. I am a Paisley shareholder. <laughs> For anyone that didn't know, Saint Barbara still exists. Mm. Does sadly still exist, and I still sadly hold shares in it. Um, as a result of the obligatory um, purchase that we made, Maddie, it was a minimum parcel of 500 bucks, which is now worth a lot less than 500 To get on the phone You're not call. obligated to still hold it, though. <laughs> I'm not, no, but I feel like it's sentimental value now. <laughs> <laughs> me- monumental sure. at the start of Money of Mine. No? Yeah. Hold a special a place souvenir. in Money of Mine's heart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what was the the deep dive into, mate? Obviously, they came out with a uh, PFS on a, um, a Canadian project that yeah, they have. Yeah, Tuesday the PFS dropped on 15 mile project. You guys didn't cover them when you did the show, but I'm keen to bring it up today. Um, you know, I think I think because we talk a lot about incentives and all that sort of stuff, and I'm curious about this company now because it's a bit of a mystery with this big cash box and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, firstly, on the study itself that came out on 15 mile project. 
the title is Strong 15 Mile Project PFS Results. I saw Chucky speculate that they only use the word strong because they must have watched our conversation about robust. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Outstanding is a bit outplayed as well. I won't spend much time talking about the study itself. Um, I'll tell you what they didn't change on the study from listening to us though is they still used a horrific 5% discount rate. If I see one of them again, it's just going in the bin. Like just sick of it. Can't. Just stop doing it. Can't, can't say it, it'll just get me. It's can't say we won't even mention it because we will because it's a five percent. Maybe that's what they're trying to do. It's the only way to get on the show is put a five percent discount rate on h- it. Hilarious, right? Because they they use the five percent discount rate in the study, then go in the annual report and do a control F for discount rate, and you'll see that the way they value their rehab liabilities on their balance sheet is with a very different discount rate. They don't tell you what it is, but they allude to the fact that they do a cap M model, work out their um, you know what the company's. And they add, add a significant risk premium and all that sort of stuff. So the the discount rate they're actually using to value the rehab liabilities is much higher than five percent. Yes. Um, what were the other sort of numbers that came so came out? Back to the study. Uh, you see, okay, so cap, okay, five percent discount rate. Ignore, ignore that, right? So the capex is Canadian one hundred and eighty two million for an NPV Canadian one hundred and seventy four million. So despite the fourth dot point on the announcement saying it's a capital efficient outcome, that ratio doesn't scream capital efficiency to me. And one, he, one to one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one to one's always not, not <laughs> okay. that good. And all for an IRR of 20.3%. This is at a PFS stage. Remember things tend to change for the worst from PFS to, to DFS as you get more certain just as a general trend. These are the sort of metrics that we typically glance at Matty and JD, and we, we normally have a bit of a comment like, oh, it's going to be tough to finance this project, right? Because it's not a capital efficient, low IRR and still less um, certainty. It sounds like a, a St. Barbara style deposit <laughs> <laughs> based on that. Oh, no, that would be negative NPV, mate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that gets me, you know, uh, worried um, is the fact that they've got a bunch of cash. So even though these metrics, you like, sort of have question marks because St. Barbara got a bunch of cash as a result of selling Leonora, you're, you're left there thinking, oh, shit, maybe they'll actually buddy, you know, fund it even though it doesn't look super robust from a um, from a, a project economics perspective. And um, so so as a St. Barbara shareholder, this realisation made me pretty upset. Most uh, sensible people look at St. Barbara, right, and they just look at the capital structure and they think, oh, there's a deep value opportunity here. And we've spoken about this on the podcast before. You broke it down brilliantly, JD. Mark. Was that the zero dollar EV one? Yeah, you mate. It's, much it's figured out. It's well, worse. it's gotten even better now because yeah. the share price has retracted more and more. Mm-hmm. The well, cash, I'm sure you'll get into mm-hmm. it, but two forty, I think, last time I mm-hmm. checked. Market cap one hundred fifty one million. Cash two hundred thirty nine million. <laughs> Note of that two hundred thirty nine million, forty seven million is restricted for Atlantic Rehab Bond. Yep. Listed investments on top of that, so shares in Kin, Peel, and Catalyst. So there's another 18 million bucks worth of listed shares there. They've also got a royalty portfolio and some unlisted shares too. For you know, like let's arbitrarily value that at five million. Call it. Calculate the EV based on those numbers. That's an EV of negative 111 million dollars. There, bonkers, right? It and- just screams opportunity. Yeah, and that's excluding the value of the projects, Atlantic and some Berry, which is surely worth something, right? And here's where it gets a bit... Looks like they're worth (laughs) negative 50 million each. (laughs) This is where it gets a bit spicy for St. Barbara, I think. Um, So appealing to that annual report I talked about before, remember all the kerfuffle in the battle for Leonora about about Atlantic and a rehab bond and all that sort of stuff. So I I was keen to pry into what... um, how St. Barbara are valuing their rehab liabilities on the balance sheet as at the latest annual report. You go to the rehab provision and uh, it's been massively restated upwards this year. It's shot up from $75 million to $128 million despite offloading the Leonora rehab liability provision. So Atlantic's rehab provision shot up by $54 million um, as more work has been done to estimate that liability r- relating to Torque Mine. There's a funky thing about rehab liability estimation on the balance sheet. The number you see as that rehab provision, um, it's actually a discounted number. So like, you know, you'll have some estimation of what you need to spend on rehab, but oftentimes, you know, you don't actually have to spend that money on closure costs and all that sort of stuff until 10 years from now and then you discount it back. 
I'd be really curious to know what St. Barbara's assumptions are as they relate to like, you know, how many, how many years, um, in how many years time are we spending and what discount rate have they used? So like, what's the real dollar value they need to spend? So you're, so you're saying the de- the rehab liability is always usually the same amount, so $50 million, but if you spend it in um, mm-hmm. 10 years time, what, are they what you see in the balance disca- sheet discounting the, it back to yeah. a... Um, present day of it terms. Present day value. 100%. And, and like when you think of it that way, mining companies often have a bit of an incentive to extend mine life of marginal projects for whatever, how many years, because it lets them, you know, at a, at a reasonable discount rate, discount the the yeah. rehab liability. Things look a bit better when you, when you kind of do that. So I don't know what the assumptions they've used for, you know, mine life and, and, um, and uh, discount rate, but I'd love to know. And Mate, there's, there's another aspect of this, which I'm sure you've dug into. I'd be keen to hear. We've spoken about it countless times with regards to how management is going to lead the company going forward. So what I specifically know, and I've got no doubt you've dug into, is what are these sort of incentives around management? So, I mean, the, the most obvious one we speak to is, is it heavily weighted towards total shareholder return? Mm. Is it weighted toward actually just pressing go on a new project? Yeah. Like what, what does that sort of look like, Matt? It, it's a really good question to ask, right? Because we just articulated negative $111 million EV. Granted, there's $128 million rehab liability that needs to be sorted out in some way, shape or form in some number of years time in the future. So I think about this as a as an opportunity, as a, as a, sh- well, a shareholder lens would sort of be thinking, you know, are, are management actually going to be incentivized to achieve um, an outcome that is in my best interest? And, you know, to your point on incentives, like we talked about the St. Barbara Board of Management, they're basically all new people now. They've all been refreshed. There's been this board refreshed, new management, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they're all new people. They've all got new incentives. There's all got a new job and the company's got a new identity in a lot of ways. So I think it's important to take a look at how these new people are being incentivized. We can actually peel that out of the, the notice of AGM lodged last month on ASX platform. The new MD, Andrew Strellen, he, he has some performance rights, I think worth taking a peek at. So there are two tranches um, of what they call project incentive performance rights to be issued to Andrew. And as I read the remuneration report, these relate to specific objectives pertaining to St. Barbara's two projects. The vesting conditions are usually a bit of a giveaway as to what management will try to do. So I'm just going to read out one part of this paragraph. Achievement of strategic performance measures linked to delivery of final investment decisions on development of 15-mile stream in Canada and expansion of Simberi operations in Papua New Guinea and related strategic outcomes for the Atlantic and Simberi assets. So there you have it. Um, That reads to me like these tranches of project performance rights are linked to FID on... Canadian asset, and which we just talked about, the returns looked a bit meh, um, and then yeah, more expansion stuff in relation to the uh, Simberi. So, or, or selling, possibly related strategic outcomes with selling. I hope so. That's so, what I'd, I'd. I hope yeah. that's in there. Um, but I've got a question mark, right? Um, and then there are the FY twenty four LTI performance rights. Fascinatingly, St. Barb's have discontinued linking these to relative. TSR or relative total shareholder return. So instead of seeing how they perform relative to a peer group, they're now basically simply measuring absolute return instead. Um, so this is this is interesting, the fact that they're doing absolute return. They say uh, ATSR, which is absolute total shareholder return, has been chosen for FY24 to recognize the changing business focus, the lack of sufficient relevant comparator group, and to incentivize executives to make decisions and deliver outcomes that benefit the company's long-term share price. Seems indicative of a company's share <laughs> price who's come down and down and down yeah. over five years <laughs> and executives haven't been compensated. Yeah, and it's un- underperformed peers, so now they're doing an absolute return. Okay, cool. I'd be okay with that if the absolute return hurdle was sufficiently large. Um that I thought it was justified, but the way they're structured, the way I read it is 100% of these FY24 performance rights will best if St. Barbara absolute total shareholder return is greater than 20% cumulatively over the three years from 1st of July, 2023 to 2026. So over three years, 20%. Jeez, we're going to go at 5% a year. No, it's 6.3%. Oh, six. 6.3% 6. per annum, right? Um, as a return Compound. on equity is yeah. would result in 100% of the performance rights vesting as I read this. So just to hone in on that point, 
You guys mentioned Minres bond the other day that they did, $1.1 billion bond. That was priced at 9.25% for a debt instrument. Yet the performance here for St. Barbara equity is 6.3% justifies vesting of performance rights. I find that bit a little bit intriguing to me. So, so they could pretty much put their cash into a term deposit at the moment <laughs> and probably get that shareholder return. Oh, you need the share price to reflect. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's a, it's a low... As an, an equity owner, you want to be rewarded bloody a lot more than um, than debt holders, especially if it's a high beta stock, right? So, Trav, you as a uh, proud, proud shareholder of St. Barb's, what are you sort of advocating for? What what would you sort of differences you might want in that REM structure or any sort of other thoughts around that? So A, obviously the goalposts are not high enough for a suitable return on equity for a high beta stock. Like, the, yeah, 6.3 is just like rubbish. Um, and B, this is to your point, Maddie. like w- what if we talked about the, you know, the negative EV and all that sort of stuff. What if the most value accretive thing you could do for shareholders is run a sale process on Atlantic and Simberry, sell them for whatever you can get, sell the shares you own in the royalties, distribute the cash and shares to shareholders, turn off the lights. I want to see that option like genuinely encouraged on its merit in the REM incentives rather than rather than me having question marks over my head if if um, if management are actually incentivized to do FID on a marginal project. And I think the underlying point to that, Trav, is that you as a shareholder based on St. Barbara's track record would think I would do better with that money in my hands than in St. Barbara's hands. And it's a guaranteed, like, well, not guaranteed, but like, assume you could run a sale process and sell them for, you know, like, whatever. Like, I don't even care if you sell them for, for nothing. And you, um, even if you have to, like, leave a little bit of cash for Atlantic in order to sort out the environmental thing, I'm fine. Distribute it back. Because of that negative EV, you actually effectively get a really positive return in a very short period of time, as opposed to risk the company eroding that cash box on a marginal. Pro- what if they spend that cash on? Um, you know, FID on this project and it, and it all doesn't work out well because the project was actually really marginal and things go wrong and it wasn't well studied. Like then you just risk destroying more capital as opposed to sort of locking in a very clear pathway to a guaranteed return, which I would much rather prefer. And I want to, I just want to see management's incentives really exploring that outcome. Like I want, I want to see management incentivized if they deliver on that. That would be great. I think, I think in the next quarter or two, to see what happens at Gualia is going. I know we're sort of we're talking either end of the spectrum here. I'll be very interested to see now that Genesis have come in, like Genesis, you know, traded a premium because of the rally in the management team that he's uh, lured together. If Gualia is only getting deeper and deeper as the months go on, if Genesis start making money as it's getting deeper, deeper, or like making money on Gualia as an operation, that will just show what. St. Barbara's quality was when they were running the asset. So if that happens, and I would not be surprised if they do because I reckon I would anticipate the Genesis have gone in like, right, our, let's get our costs from here down to here. And then I, I would anticipate they will be they will make money on it and it will just show if they can make money on it deeper than St. Barbara, that just really highlights what St. Barbara was. Mm. So, But that hasn't happened yet. Well, they, that are pretty reasonable quarter to start off on the transition. But if they can uh, show that, it'll show, yes, it was in the wrong hands. Trav, you also had a bit of a dive on BlackRock, getting into a bit of graphite, mate. Quick quick one here. So aspiring graphite miner, BlackRock Mining, uh, ticker BKT. They returned to trade yesterday after about 10-day hiatus from quotation. They got an update on their debt process, so the, the – they talk about a lend- lenders um, having provided initial sort of an in- initial stage credit approval. Um, that's not final approval. So they reference development finance institutions. So you can think some concessional rates for some of that debt. I would assume there's a big task ahead of them though. Like so, they got their Mahenge graphite project in Tanzania has an initial capital requirement of circa US two hundred million. So POSCO put their hand up and um, said they'll be there for US forty when they do the. The, um, the funding piece there, and they're targeting 50% debt. So if you assumed all that debt was there, don't know if it is, but if you assumed it was all there, that leaves them with another 60 million US of equity to find. And um, for reference, that's about the 
the US equivalent size of their current market cap. So it's a lot of new equity they need. They'll be hoping for a, for a higher graphite price in the market to turn before they kind of have to pull the trigger on, on that one. If yeah, they, that'd be they a get there. Yeah. pretty dilutive raise, wouldn't it be? Yep. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, graphite's a weird one. Hopefully we'll talk about it one day. But um, you look out in the landscape, there's a lot of, yeah, aspirants out there. But like the the – it, the the ones that are worth paying attention to are probably the ones that have actually done qualification. So they spent the three to five years it takes to actually get your product qualified. Um, and and you want to see that validation from an actual, you know, a buyer, i.e. POSCO, which, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's worth paying attention to, but like graphite market looks really fucked. <laughs> Mate, LPI, we touched on these guys not too long ago. So they they held the tenements in and around green bushes, sold them, got about 30 million bucks for that. Then they moved the focus to South America, sort of brine operations, lithium. And then when we spoke about them, Matty, it was you and I, we spoke about um, Codelco, the uh, copper giant state-owned entity from Chile, being interested in a possible transaction. So it was I think interesting, from- the, interesting this morning, they were open trading for 20 minutes, went up 18%, now straight into a pause in trading. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so from when the rumours started, they've, mm. they've launched quite, quite a bit higher, but like you said, now, now in trading hold. Something's again. obviously in, imminent. I, yep. I had to yep. do some digging on Twitter to, to see what's going on there. A bit of word on the decline from Twitter, so you know it's true, from at TCE underscore C. LPI, Cadelco bid rumoured at 50 cents per share. Um, so anyway, there's your word on the decline. We'll see what happens. It's got to be hold. true. <laughs> Matty. I think it was, uh, I was talking to someone, it's one of the most under, someone in the buy side quoted to me that uh, LPI is one of the most undervalued lithium projects going around. Yeah, not for so, much longer at this rate. <laughs> mm, so by, based on the size and everything. So yeah. there's obviously something but, Chile's going to get their hands on it by the looks. Is that when it was 18% cheaper? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Last but not least, let's talk about one that is, you know, probably not the most undervalued lithium play out there, Wildcat. Wow, good, <laughs> I like that, Wildcat. They give me, they bailed me up at the bloody, I uh, went to the Mayfair one, Harvey. Oh. Someone walks up, bloody, give me a Wildcat out. I'm like, oh, shit, what did we say about them again? <laughs> <laughs> they were coming out. The, the tallest, biggest bastards I've ever seen. If we pissed them off, I wouldn't have been able to Jeez. flog them. They're huge. Well, well the money miners, plays. they might remember that we had Bogan Geo actually tune into his thoughts, given it was uh, real early stage yep. exploration drilling. So that yeah, well, was three odd weeks ago, I'd say, and then they've come out with a bit more. When I last checked, they were down almost 20%. I think it might have softened a bit since then. What do you, what'd you uncover? Well, they're down 12.5% today. But look, remember they're, at the moment they're a $250 million market cap undiluted and I'm pretty sure about 50% on top of that takes it to fully diluted from memory. Yeah. So was, I think it would be three. When it was 40 cents, I remember it was a $600 odd million dollar market cap. So yeah. 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 So I think it's probably 375 or something fully, fully diluted. So they released some drill results from the, oh, I can't pronounce it, Hutt and Lee Pegmatite. So Leah. Lee, Leah. Is it L E I A? Leah, Leah. I've never known you not to back yourself. Yeah, eh? <laughs> that's a, so that's the central cu- cluster. So fifty-two meters at one point three percent, thirty-five at one point five percent. These are estimated true widths too. The hut, which is the northern cluster, uh, sixteen meters at one point three percent. So yes, a, um, a cleansing statement just come out as well because of the issue of security. So yeah, and uh, we'll talk about that in a tick as well. Um, so they obviously. Had to have to put them out to be cleansed for the issue of securities from their previous raise. Yeah, essentially the all the um, info that they have have to share with the market. That's the yeah. the simplistic gist of it. Yeah. So look, as I said, very very sensitive to these twelve percent movements due to it being an exploration play in in the vicinity of Pilgangora and Wajina <laughs> with such a high market cap. Yeah. So I think there's I think volatility like this is is to be expected. Look, you can if you look at the picture we put up here, the they did say the the thicknesses intersections are getting thicker at depth, but then you do look at that intersection, there is like the the big thick pegmatite body, but it doesn't look like it's mineralized the whole way through. It yeah, the market like, really trying to get a grasp of what the, the true width is. That true been width, one of the big true questions. width and the continuity and the internal dilution. So of look, course. early days, but, you know, very, um, would you say, fully valued for 
Uh, do you say fully valued for an exploration play, Trey? I don't know how you. It's I, I don't know high. It's, it's it's high value compared to uh, a lot of other lithium explorers, but they're they're yeah. in the proximity. They're onto something anyway. So it's so interesting that, to see how it plays out. I haven't I haven't gone through the ASX announcements, but there's a bunch out there. All of the application for quotation of securities, so, but they got recent approvals for um, the acquisition of Tabba Tabba, which basically meant they could issue those new shares. Any of those uh, any of those shares issued quoted today, i.e. were people who were sitting on like a large um, unrealised sort of capital gains taking some chips off the table today because their shares are quoted for the first big, time? It was big, big volume. I can't confirm that, but there okay. was a, a lot of shares traded today. Yeah, okay. Mm. I'll, uh, I'll just a, a bit of addition to the Azure segment we did the other day. Um bit extra info and it's to do with the cleansing. So when, when JD and I were going through the, the MET results, as we said, there was only one hole with flotation results, three holes total, and there was no info on magnetic separation. That's because, and you would have seen a cleansing statement come out uh, as an announcement just after that. So the, and the, so the reason for that, they had to, when they have to cleanse, means they have to get all information out that they currently have to the market because the tranche to shares for SQM and Creasy, that you can't have information not out to the market when you issue new shares. So you so cleanse the market. So you cleanse the market. So that that's why that the metal the they didn't they, they sort they of released mag- a half baked metallurgical result because they didn't yeah. have the full flotation results. They didn't have the magnetic Except, yeah. magnetic separation results. Yeah. So everyone was sort of up in arms, and I, I do I do think they it was the word they could have worded it better saying because there was different interpretations on when it said not amenable to DMS. It does that mean it should have been worded? And if this is the correct interpretation, not amenable to DMS only pro- processing. Gotcha. That that like, that's gotcha. That's what they want to know. Is it a DMS only, or do you need flotation? And a deposit of that scale, similar to Pilgain Gora, there'll always be a flotation plan in there. You would imagine something something that size. You wouldn't take the risk. And I did ask um, the question to some people about: Can you, if it is not amenable at all to DMS, can it just go straight into a flotation? But they said there will always be some element of coarse grain material and if because if you just went straight in the fr- flotation, you'd have to up everything in the mill. You'd have to have more crushing capacity to get it down to a finer grind. You'd have to have bigger flotation tanks. That's why the DMS circuit means that it takes away that coarse material. You don't need as much capacity in the flotation. So to go flotation only would mean a, a lot larger scale crushing and flotation so there would be even though if it's not amenable to much of the dms there still will be coarse material and there will be a dms so pretty similar to the pill gang or pill gang plant mm. so awesome. cheers cheers australia mr lithium for that comment not the american one there's an australian one Is there? there you go i've given him the nickname so <laughs> guys we've got a uranium chat coming up we do. and there's some uranium news to um to pre like a bit of a bit of a teaser Look, we got yeah talking to guy keller in about 40 minutes time who runs the uh, nuclear fund for for tribeca and um yeah there's a i oh, saw a few few uranium headlines in the last day or so one was that devx were out raising 21.1 million bucks so that's tim goiter's backed um, yeah, uranium play. Got yep. a few assets floating about in Australia. And the other one was Boss Energy announced that they'd commenced mining operations at, at Honeymoon yesterday. So a bit of, bit of uh, news flow out for the uranium stocks and we're keen to talk about those stories and more with Guy in 40 minutes' time, which we'll upload in due course. Beautiful. Perfect. Couple of sponsors to thank. Oh, mate, JD, out. you've been on a roll. Lead it away, sunshine. Cheers to uh, JP Search, Terra Capital, K-Drill, Smeck and Anytime Exploration Services. Appreciate it, guys. We've booked in a bit of BD with Terra Capital on our iMark trip. Am I looking forward to that night? Hooteroo. Can't wait. Hooteroo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.